Well, hey, before we dive into your book, I want to ask you a question that I ask most of the guests on the podcast to give a little flavor for who you are and the journey you've been on. If you were to look at the last 10 years of your faith journey, how would you say that your faith has changed in the last 10 years? I think um, what has happened is some things about my belief system have been affirmed more than change. Um, I've always thought a particular way, which we'll talk about when we talk about my book, but I didn't really know that there were other people that believed the way I believe. Ooh, yeah. And so in the, you know, in 2020 mm-hmm. is when I, I had that aha moment that there are others out there that think like I think, and not on everything, but on, on the really important things. And that would be the major shift for me and that I am bolder about what I believe over and I don't want to say against other beliefs, but I'm just bolder. I'm be- better better able to explain why I believe what I believe. Yeah, what a great feeling that is when you start to see something and then you wonder, does anyone else see this? Yeah. <laughs> does anyone else feel this? And then you meet them and you learn names for this stuff and you go, oh my goodness, what a, what a great journey that is. Now, I want to begin by just highlighting, we're going to be talking through uh, Deanna's book called Unblaming God, which is a great title. First off, I just want to say this was the book I asked for when I was in college. So I don't know where you were back then, but uh, when I graduated college, my undergrad in particular, I remember realizing I was launching into my own reading list. You know, I had for four years, I'd been given all my books assigned and now I could read whatever I wanted. And I wanted to make sense of like, okay, what do we do with how different God is in the Old Testament with the New Testament? And like, if God looks like Jesus, I've got some work to do. And at that point, I didn't really know, I didn't have the tools how to do that. And so I remember going to one of my favorite Bible professors and I said, hey, here's what I'm working through. Can you give me a great book recommendation? And he gave me a textbook, like a a giant textbook. And it was like a survey of the Old Testament. I was like, fun, fun. Yeah. No, I, I, I got that. Like, I understand. I, I know the stories. What I don't mm-hmm. understand is how are we making sense of that pointing to Jesus? And Deanna, you could have saved me a ton of time is what I'm saying. So hopefully you are saving others a ton of time who may be at that point in their journey. And they may be asking a similar question of like, how do we make sense of this? And you do a great job with this. Uh, one of the things you say In the book, you say, I've discovered that my theology is in alignment with ORT, which you can explain, which has helped me to better articulate what I believe and why. What was your journey into this way of thinking? And tell us a little bit about this theology. Okay. Um, I've always believed that God is love. And as you said, sometimes when I think like this and I look at the Old Testament, it doesn't make sense. There's a dissonance there. Also, when I hear people um, say, why did God do this? Or why didn't God do that? And me thinking, well, if God is love, then God didn't do that. And God couldn't do that. You know, it, it started to kind of come together for me, but about, it was during the pandemic that I, Tom, Thomas Award sent me a book, God Can't. Have you read that one? I have. Yeah. And I, I don't know how I got on his radar. I really don't, but I'm so happy I did. Well, I had read that book and I said, aha, yes, this is, this is it. This is, this is the way I think. And I taught it at my church and people struggled with a lot of it, but just say, how did that go? Yeah. You know, they knew me. And so they trusted me. And that's the first thing is you have to have a trust established before you can teach something like this. 
and, and you do it gently. <laughs> but not everybody bought into it. But I had um, reached out to Tom on Messenger and told him I was teaching it. And he said, well, if you have any questions or you want to set up a Zoom with your class. And I had a question or whatever. And he said, let's Zoom. And so I Zoomed with him. And that's when I discovered he had the doctoral program. And um, but we delved a little deeper into open and relational theology. And that was that was probably early on in the pandemic or maybe in the summer of 2020. Yeah. And then by December, I was enrolled in his doctoral program. <laughs> you, you had found a home. I had found a home and it was, I just, just kept reading and, and trying mm -hmm. to understand how we got to where we were as opposed to how I believe, yeah. you know, and, um, it was so helpful to me. And I started sharing that with my parishioners and in little bits. But um, after God can't, some of them just really wanted to know more. And then when I wrote I'm Blaming God, I taught two classes at my church. I taught that book. And out of about 50 people, I only had one that couldn't, couldn't agree, couldn't see his way clear to agree. And that's fine. I'm okay with that. But others have used words, life-changing. Uh, some of them said the same thing you do. Where have you been all of my life? Where has this book been all of my life? Yeah. But um, it's so helpful as a, as a pastor, hearing people asking me the hard questions, I wanted to be able to have a reasonable answer. And I do now. I do. And so I finished my doctorate and uh, I started in 2020 at the end of the year and I finished my doctor. I defended my dissertation January 2023. Very a lot well. of reading and a lot of writing. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's awesome. You say in the book, when I retired as a pastor, I do not believe that God knew that within a year I would work as a pastor again. So it's a fun little uh, tie into open theism there of, of how you view God's uh, foreknowledge. But I'm also curious just about a little bit your story. What caused you to retire and then go back into being a pastor a year later? Well, I retired in 2019, and I don't know if you know anything. I, United, I'm United Methodist pastor, and that was the year the General Conference was kind of ugly over the issue of homosexuality. And I just, at that part, I'd hung in there for a long time thinking things would change, things would get better, we would love everyone, we would allow opportunities for everyone. And it didn't appear that that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so I retired and then um, started going to a church in my neighborhood, a United Methodist church in my neighborhood. First, I talked to the pastor. I wanted to see where he stood on the topic of homosexuality. And we were like minded. Started going there. And then when the pandemic hit, um, I was at a church, I was at a Zoom church council meeting and I heard him say, you know, it's going to be like 9-11. People can just flock to the churches after the pandemic is over. And at that time, we he thought it was going to be a few months. And I just offered my help. I said, I sent him an email. It was titled, have I got a deal for you? And I offered to help him navigate COVID for a year as a gift to the church. He said yes. Then after that year was up, they offered me a 
position. I'm the executive pastor there. And I love it. So the church has changed. I, we just had another general conference where all the uh, restricted language and exclusionary language has been removed from our book of discipline. Um, it's a beautiful thing. Hmm. It's a beautiful thing. Now, to my knowledge, I was trying to think this through. You're, I think you're the first Methodist I've had on the podcast. So uh, I don't want to miss an opportunity here. I'd love to know, what do you enjoy most about the Methodist tradition? And what do you struggle with the most with the Methodist tradition? I enjoy, the reason why I'm a Methodist, because I was baptized Catholic. Uh, the reason why I'm a Methodist, my father was Methodist. My mother was um catholic and um i'm muting this and the idea that i that not everyone could take communion at the catholic table bothered me and the methodist table is wide open because it's not our table and the other thing is um focus on grace in the United Methodist Church. I love the focus on grace. And those are the main, main reasons why I'm Methodist. Now, what I struggle with the most, and I'll say this right here um, for all the world to hear, as a female <laughs> in a church, as an older female in a church, I do not believe I had the same opportunities that males had. And I struggle with that. Um, I am now with a pastor that is highly encouraging to women. So it's, it's wonderful. And it's not that I want special privileges. I want to have the same opportunities hmm. and given the same, given the gifts and graces, I have be able to lead a large church where that up until recently that hasn't, happened for females so that's the thing i struggle with but it sounds like you're seeing some positive trends in where this tradition is going absolutely i am more now than i have been in a long time for the united methodist church we had a lot of churches leave united methodism um in our conference the texas annual conference over half of the churches disaffiliated really over the topic of homosexuality wow. and interpretation of scripture. And in my district, we went from about 60 churches to about 14. You know, I think these are great examples for people to keep in their mind when someone says the Bible is clear and <laughs> you know, it's often used in conversation on subjects such as homosexuality, which there are wide, <laughs> wide diversions of interpretation. You know, if, if you are tempted, uh, dear listener, to conclude, yeah, you know, this is, this, the Bible is so clear. She's giving you a great example of within a single tradition, how much disagreement and fallout there can be. And again, these are not like Christians from all ends of the spectrum. This is within the Methodist tradition. I just think is a, this is like a great real life data point for people to go, oh, it's not super clear. It requires interpretation and you can have people you would respect that would land all, all different angles on yes. some of these topics. Yeah. It's not clear at all. And it requires work. Mm -hmm. We got to do the work to, to figure out what we think it's saying. And I begin every class that I teach, like at the beginning, if I'm going to teach a class right now. I'm teaching a class on the gospel of Matthew that I, that I wrote. And I begin it by telling people, I'm not going to tell them what to think. I'm going to help them figure out what they believe and why. And, and hopefully we'll be able to better articulate it when the class is over. Cause, because we're theologians. When we think about God, we're doing theology. So yeah, it's, it's a challenging uh, topic and, there would be those on the other side of the, the churches that are disaffiliated that would say that we no longer believe 
in Jesus or a lot of these other things that are not true. It's just, it's the bottom line, as I see it, is interpretation of scripture. Mm. And the whole topic of homosexuality, if you, if you study it, if you study the Pauline passages, it's not homosexuality as we know it. Mm-hmm. It is not that at all. It's the exploitation of one human being of another is what it is. Mm-hmm. So um, I wrote a paper on that too. Maybe maybe we'll get into that on the next podcast with you. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll table that one because I would love yeah. to, I'd love to get to that. I want to share... I think what my favorite idea, so if I had to take a single idea and go, this one was like just gold out of the book. I really love this. So th- th- this one, I, it's a, a little bit long, but I want to read this. You say this and you repeat this idea numerous times, but I just pulled one of them. The name God and love should be able to be used interchangeably. If the scripture does not make sense after love is substituted, then maybe we should understand that the interpretation says more about the culture than it does about God. We should also be able to use the names God and Jesus interchangeably. Deanna, this is such a great idea. Probably my favorite takeaway from your book. So practical. Like this is something anyone with any level of spiritual training or like day one into reading the Bible. You can, you can start working with this and it's a great tool to use. I've never heard it said mm-hmm. as succinctly as you, as you say it here, how does this help people, this simple technique, how does this help people work through and get to a better theology? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, I, I talk about a woman in my, in my book that lost a granddaughter to cancer. And she had asked, one of the questions she wanted to ask Tom was, why would God give me my beautiful granddaughter just to take her from me at the age of 12? Um, I've had conversations with her about it if you insert love in there, it doesn't make any sense. Love wouldn't do that. And she has come to a new understanding. I heard her tell somebody the other day, God didn't do that. And for me, the writing the book, the going to school, all of that is worth it for that one woman Mm. to come to the understanding that that's not God. It's not the kind of God we have. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are so many instances, the flooding that happens, uh, Hurricane Katrina, God did this for this reason or that reason. Love doesn't do that. And I think if people can just start thinking, like I said, as God, God as love and try and, if it makes sense, then if it doesn't, then we have something else to figure out, you know, and it has given people uh, hope and the freedom to believe in God again, the way they, they want to love God, you know, and it's, it's pretty amazing. I don't think it's not an original idea that God is love. Obviously it's biblical, but um, I have for a long time been using the interchangeable language, except I would say, if God is love then, but now I change it in since God is love then. Hmm. Or you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's different. It is very different. There's no if to me right. anymore. We start with that assumption. We start with that assumption. And my question to people is, can you go wrong with that? I mean, how can that be wrong? It's 
you're not taking a chance. You're not, um, you're not, even if, even if by some chance we were wrong, so what? We're erring on the side of love and grace. How can that be wrong? Well, I think the, the tension there and, you know, to, to speak to perhaps a more conservative Christian, uh, they would, they would apply this. They would read something in the old Testament. I'll, I'll pick on my least favorite chapter in the whole Bible, which is number 31. I can't stand numbers 31. I think it's just disgusting from start to finish. If you, if you tried this with numbers 31, you would quickly go, this makes no sense. Any of this, any of the story makes no sense because love would not do any of the things that God is portrayed as doing and saying and instructing. Yeah. And, and I think that's where someone will go, well, but it's in the text, you know, it's, it's there. So we have to do something with it. So let's, let's let that, that person into this conversation they're reading Numbers 31. They're going, no, God did command the Israelites to take all these virgins as spoils of war. And God even gets some of the virgins for himself, which is just this uh, ugliest idea ever. Mm -hmm. But in Numbers 31, that God gets some of the virgins, you know, and just all this very barbaric understanding of war. And you had to completely eradicate people using your technique would quickly fall apart. And then someone will go, yeah, but that's in the text. What do you say to them? How do you help them in that moment of tension where they're going, it's in the text. I can't insert love here. What do they do? I ask them, uh, are they are they Christian? First of all, let me ask you. Yes. I mean, you know the situation. They are Christian? Yeah, we'll say they're Christian. Would Jesus do that? So here's an interesting, this is an interesting uh, question. <laughs> I, I was the lead pastor for, for a few years, and I had a guy one time who was taking seminary classes, and he asked if he could meet with me. And I could tell he had just started a seminary because he said in his email that he was concerned about my hermeneutic of the Old Testament. No no normal person talks like that. So I knew you're in a Bible class. You, you just learned a new word, and you're throwing it around because you like it, right? So I said, okay. And he, he, he said, what? can you please explain to me your hermeneutic of how you read the Old Testament? And I said something probably similar to what you were saying. Like I interpreted it all through the person of Jesus Christ that, you know, I go John 5 39, Jesus said all the scriptures point to him. Therefore that's my starting point. I worked my way backward. I, I, you know, I didn't have the language you're using here of I swap, you know, God and love, but basically that same idea. And then I asked him, I, I don't know if I used number 31 or something similar. I said, when you read all that, can you envision Jesus doing that? And Deanna, I kid you not, he said yes. And I looked at him and I went, oh, this is a very different conversation than I thought we were going to have. And I said, if you if you can imagine Jesus doing that and saying that, I said, then Jesus can be anything. Because if Jesus can be that, and then Jesus can be what we see in the Gospels, then literally Jesus is a catch-all for any idea we want of God. And it doesn't have to have any semblance of, of uh, connection there. So I just have found there are people that I think would legitimately answer the question because it's in the text, right? That's what they would say. It's in there. Therefore, it's got to be okay with God. The Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. Amen. Um, well, here's the the thing, I was speaking at a conference in Napa, and it was before I finished my book, but I was talking about the premise of the book. And I talked about how Jesus, we don't read about Jesus ever committing an act of violence. And of course, guess what somebody pointed to? The turning the tables in the temple. Yes. Yeah. And I said, well, I don't believe he inflicted violence on anyone, but he made a whip. <laughs> I've had this. I've had this thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying yes. And you know, if you think about um, the definition of love, I think is Tom. I don't know if it's Tom's definition of love is promoting the well-being of God's creatures and creation. 
And that's exactly what Jesus was doing there in that moment. But there are some people that their foundation is built upon the um, literal interpretation of scripture. And if we strip that away, it, you know, the whole deconstruction thing, but people don't think necessarily that that's a good idea. I have people that think it's okay that God committed acts of violence as depicted in the Old Testament because it's God. And if God does it, then it's good and right. Then I point to the New Testament and Jesus and I said, how do you make sense of the difference? But they can't. Mm -hmm. Or they say, you know, just change. Well, then I then I can point, well, do you believe that God can change? Like, I mean, it it's just you have to keep having the conversation. But there's some people you, you just understand that they're not ready to take that step because it scares them. Yeah. And I get that. And we have to be willing to have a conversation with them and accepting, you know, respecting what they say because they're coming from it probably from years and years of teaching and, and their understanding. And that's part of their thrownness, which I use in the book. Their, their tradition, their experiences, everything they know has come to bring them to the point that they are in that, in that conversation. I'm probably not going to change that in that moment. Maybe plant a seed. Maybe they'll come back and think about it later. And what usually helps people kind of get over that hump of, oh, it might be okay to deconstruct is trauma. Mm. When something bad happens in, in a person's life and they thought, okay, it's like Joe, I'm, I'm a pretty good per person. Nothing bad should ever, ha God loves me. Nothing bad should ever happen to me. And then bam, something bad happens and they're trying to figure out, okay, what's, what's going on mm -hmm. here? Um, when I, I think it was with Josh Pat, Patterson, I was doing a podcast and he talked about trauma informed theology. And I think trauma can really help us change our theology. Um, because we, I think we want to believe in a good God, a good and loving God. 